Good afternoon. Hope everyone's having a great um, second official day of High Point Market, and uh, welcome to Universal Furniture. Uh, my name is Neil McKenzie. I'm the Senior Vice President of Marketing here. And uh, in this space, you're in the Learning Center. We have a number of events over the course of market here that address a number of different topics. We'll wait for this. Hold on one second. Great. <laughs> We're waiting for you. Hello. Okay, great. We're waiting. All right. We're waiting for place, you. No, it's okay. She just placed an order. Um, so no, that was uh, a big one. Good. All universal. So um, in the Learning Center, we have a number of events. We record them all. So if you have registered for something and you've missed something or you saw something that you wanted to attend, uh, we do record everything. We put that out on our website where you registered for the event. Um, about two weeks after market, we do blast it out to folks. We put it on social. So you'll find everything. So if you do miss anything, uh, know that it will be there. Uh, from our space, it's a large space. If it's your first time here, if it's your second time, welcome back. Uh, we have 115,000 square feet of showroom space, three floors. On the third floor, we have our new modern introduction, which is about 185 SKUs, tons to see. Second floor, some great in-stock looks. And on the first floor, the ground floor that you're on, we have all of our special ordering offerings, which are made uh, in Conover, North Carolina, in six to eight weeks, including our new dining chair program. So be sure to check that out. And if you want to see anything, and we hope you see it all, just check in at the front desk afterwards, and you can um, also pick up a little scanner. Uh, speaking of streamlining your purchasing process, so um, everything in the showroom is tagged. You can actually scan everything that you like, and then when you check out, you get an email with all the things that you uh, scanned, and then you'll uh, be able to actually go ahead and purchase, which that's what we would like. So, um, so I'm going to turn it over to uh, Rick Campos, and um, we appreciate everybody coming in, and uh, thank you all for being here, and uh, enjoy. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you so much for having us. All right, are you guys ready to talk about streamlining your purchasing process? <laughs> We're going to take a little poll before we get started. Gail did it earlier, and so I'm going to copy what she did. <laughs> how, many, I'm not sure. how many people in the room have been in business for one to five years? Okay, all right. Yay. And then five to 10 years? More than 10 years. Oh, so we've got a great diverse group here yeah. to talk to. So this is exciting. All right. Well, I'm glad that you guys are here today. I appreciate the opportunity. I'm looking forward to uh, sharing as much as we can about purchasing with you because I know it's kind of a hot topic. Um, so I think that this is going to be a very beneficial conversation. My name is Rick Campos. I am the host and founder of Design Biz Survival Guide, which is a podcast for interior design professionals. Uh, we talk about life and the business of design. I also do coaching and I produce uh, learning events for designers. Uh, I am a self-proclaimed recovering interior designer. I <laughs> have been in that seat doing exactly what you did for 12 years. I ran my own business for six years and then helped run someone else's business for another six years. And um, so I really leveraged that uh, experience to help designers grow a better business. So I'm happy to be here. Um, with that being said, let's carry on with introductions. I'm going to ask you each to do an introduction of yourself because we want to hear what you would like for us to know about you. Tell us a little bit about you and your business model. We'll start with you, Kate. Okay. Hi. Hi, everyone. I am Kate Lester. I am an interior designer from Southern California, sunny Southern California. Um, I also own a retail brand, Kate Lester Home. Um, I own two retail stores and an e-commerce business. And I also have a line of rugs with J. Per Living. Um, I'm really happy to be here. I can't wait to talk about purchasing and making money. Yay. <laughs> Hi, I'm Bria Hamill. Um, I own Bria Hamill Interiors, and then I also have a retail business called Brook & Lou. Um, I've been in business for 11 years with Bria Hamill Interiors, and we just had our five-year anniversary for Brook & Lou. We're based in Minnesota, um, but we only do about 20% of our work in Minnesota, so we're all over the country on an airplane every single week. Um, but yeah, I'm very happy to be here. Um, morning. Um is it on? Yeah, okay, good. Okay. My name is Peter Mitchell. Uh, I work for MM Interior Design Group. We're based just 30 minutes up the road in Greensboro, North Carolina. So uh, we're spoiled. We can get to market very, very regularly. <laughs> um, our company has been in business since 1989. So that's 34 years. I don't know if anybody can uh, beat that here. Um, we have uh, 13 designers on our team. Um, we are sort of hardcore 
design, layout, layouts and renderings and so forth. We do sell merchandise, but uh, we don't have a retail store. And uh, happy to be here today. Great, well, welcome all of you. So my first question for the panel is, uh, if you could share a little bit about your purchasing process, like what does that look for you in-house? Is it something that you do internally with a team of people? Do you have assigned people that do it or do you outsource it? Because some people outsource it. So I'd like to hear how that works in each of your offices and then we'll kind of dive into the pros and cons associated with that. And Peter, let's start with you. Yeah. So as I said, we're hardcore design rather than retail. So every project that we do, and we do about 150 or so projects a year, so we do a lot of projects um, uh, coast to coast um, uh, in the Carolinas and then in many other cities. So every project has merchandise associated with it. So essentially our process is the designers um, do the layouts, they do the um, renderings, and then we'll start proposing furniture for, for the client. Um, if the client wants to purchase um, merchandise from us off that proposal, uh, we require a deposit. I don't mind sharing. We require 85% deposit. And if they buy it through us as soon as, they, as soon as we receive that deposit, then the designers um, uh, sort of step aside from the project and it moves into operations where our operations group then starts placing orders for that merchandise and expediting it, getting it, getting it into our warehouse, checking it, making sure there's no damage and so forth, getting it ready for delivery. And then on uh, installation day, everything gets staged and taken to the client and installed then. So we have a pretty clear um, split in our company between the design side of the business and the operation side of the business. And so the designers are not really involved in placing the orders or getting acknowledgements or uh, having to um, follow up and expedite and check on deliveries and stuff like that. They can move on to the next project. Excellent. What about you, Bria? Yeah, we're, I would say we're set, set up fairly similar. Um, a long time ago when I started the business and I started hiring employees, I realized that if we all worked in our sweet spots, we would do a better job and I would keep my employees longer because they're happier. And so we've had an expediter um, as part of our company for quite some time. Now their, their role and who is who it is that's doing it and, um, you know, how many people are on like the operations team has certainly fluctuated over the years. I will say that we've actually we went from a really small team to a really large team. We were in the, we had probably 24 employees of that were in-house at one point. And now we're down to a smaller team again because we've gotten so good about streamlining and what we're investing in for our software, how we're doing it, writing out our processes, training. My team has been with me now for, I mean, I've been in business for 11 years and a lot of them have been with me for six plus years. So they're just a lot better than they used to be. They know what they're doing. Um, so I I love to keep things in-house as much as I can because I think that we have that flexibility of being able to poke holes in things and check our processes. And we have a, um, we call it an L10 meeting every single Monday um, where the entire team gets together and talks about operations and customer service and design projects and all of that. So um, it's really allowed us to just streamline it um, and keep it all in-house and not feel like we're all burning at both ends and having to outsource all of this work. Yeah, because sometimes outsourcing is just one more thing to look after. It's one more box to check. And so... Well, and you still, you still have to have someone that manages the person that's out, being outsourced. So then it's like, Correct. well, why don't you just have the person that's managing that person do the work, you know? So, <laughs> so true. <laughs> Kate? Yes, we, um, we do not outsource anything. Um, I mean, we outsource some things, but not any, not any purchasing. Um, our, our retail business is completely separate from our design business. Um, our goal has always been to have a few really high caliber design projects. That has always been my, my 5, 10, 15, 20 year plan, right? I think that's everybody's plan, right? Raise your hand if that's your plan, right? Like send the jet so that I can come and do your house, right? Okay, so the goal has always been that I would love a small boutique firm with really great team 
and we would do five to seven gorgeous, fabulous homes, right? So um, as we get to that that point, um, I've been doing this about 15 years, um, That's the team has been tailored to that. So we do have a lead designer and then we have a small team for each project. And what I've found is that we actually tailor things a little bit differently where I found that my lead designer does kind of want to be involved in those custom pieces. They kind of want to go to the workroom and they want to check in on those drawings. They want to make sure that left hand facing chaise is actually left hand facing. They don't want the junior, junior, junior running over there, right? So I think that there's some things that we that, you know, it's okay for the junior, junior, junior to do, right? They can check on the orders from that are, you know, that are not customizable pieces. Um, but there are things that the lead designer still wants to be involved in. So we do have those weekly meetings as well. And then we have our spreadsheets and our, you know, um, you know, for things that are actually ready-made pieces that we are ordering and tracking and everything's color coded. And, you know, we have those weekly meetings. So, um, but we do keep everything in house because just like you're saying, um, you have to manage the person who is outsourcing and they don't know which way the shades should be facing. They don't know the floor plan. They don't know anything. So there are so much room for error. I think when you're outsourcing furniture purchasing, um, they don't know if that finish is ebony or light ebony, or they don't know if that picture is correct. I just think that having that, um, team in-house and the people who are actually working on the project, I think it's really important. And my senior designer, my lead designer checks in with those junior juniors all the time to make sure that those photographs are coming in and those finishes are, you know, the proper finishes and correct. Um, so, you know, when you're doing design, build, furnish, it's really important that you leave yourself enough time to check all those finishes to, you know, check everything as you go. So I think that, uh, in-house is the way to go if you can do it, if you can swing it. What would let me add to this question really quickly because we have a diverse group of designers in the room. Obviously, we all had to start somewhere. So I know there was a time when all of you did your own purchasing, right? And what is your advice for people who are just they're solopreneurs and they're thinking about growing their team, but at the moment they're doing their own purchasing? Um, so I always tell people if you're a one person show, just make sure that you stay organized. Um, the more that you can document and even if it's just you create your own processes because the likeliness I feel like almost everyone ends up having at least an assistant you know it's like it's really a hard business to do completely by yourself so the more that you can document and create a process especially if it's um, a part you know something new that you're doing for example maybe you get an out-of-state project and how do you set up in your software we were just talking about this before um, this panel of the sales taxes to go for that state. And how are you setting up the new warehouse? And there's so many pieces and processes that go into our jobs that the more you can document, the better. We use Asana um, in our company and like live and breathe. Now I use it for my grocery list at home. <laughs> like I, The only thing I haven't done is gotten my husband into it so I can assign him tasks. Um, <laughs> I'm not saying I won't. I just haven't gotten there yet. <laughs> But Asana is like, I, I actually was just telling my hair, my lady that does my hair who owns her own salon, I'm like, you need to start using Asana. Like create these, create your to-do lists and create your processes. We store all of our processes in Asana. So it's really easily accessible. I can access it on my computer or my phone. Um, and it just, you can document. So you, like for our client projects, we create a template so that it just, every time we get a new project, we just duplicate the template. We don't have to think of like, what are all the things I need to do for this project? Um, and you just copy it over. And then you have those processes already in place to stay organized. And if you're going to be doing the expediting too, like it, we're using both sides of our brain then, right? So you're using that creative side to design it. And then you have to have that analytical side to get all the documentation properly. And Or you don't stay in business because you lose too much money making mistakes. So just documentation and Asana, I highly recommend. It's a very user-friendly platform. And I think it's free um, as long as for a certain amount of people in your room. Yeah, it's A-S-A-N-A. I, I also think like don't get too bogged down in like I have to place the orders and I have to do this. Think about what we did was when I first started, I created a like a tear sheet that would go with the tear sheet of the furniture that was like an ordering checklist so that when I had a part-time assistant who I paid 
you know, minimum wage. Um, she was very young. She was lovely. And I would gather packets of things that needed to be ordered and I would fill out the checklist. What was the finished? How many I needed? Where was it shipping? What was the person's name? Who was the contact? And she would come and she'd do all the ordering for me, right? Where I answered every question because I needed to be working on my business, not in my business. Please remember that, right? Your time is valuable. So please go out and work on your business, not in your business if it's just you. And you can outsource something like that. Just stay organized and create a system for yourself that if you can have someone that you can pay minimum wage to do something simple that you can stay organized and you can create a tear sheet like that and they can come in for an hour or two and help you with that, um, ordering supplies or doing things, you know, ordering just simple ready-made items, maybe not the custom chaise. Okay, guys. Um, but the simpler items, then you can work on your business, not in it, which is really important. Peter, do you want to add to that? Uh, um, yeah, I can add a little bit. I think uh, for most people, when they're getting started, they're probably going to be using QuickBooks and Excel to get your business started. And when your client is evaluating your work, they're not only evaluating your great design, but if the delivery of merchandise is completely disorganized, then that's not going to be a good experience for them. So you've got to be organized to the point um, that was made here. And I think um, um, just to expand a little bit on, on, on this topic is at some point, everybody's going to go from being the individual designer to starting to add staff. You're talking about that, having folks to handle the accounting and the follow-up. And I think the next progression after that is you keep adding more and more and more staff. And that's money. That's expense. That's taking away from your profit. And to Bria's point here, she said that staff probably got bigger than what you wanted to, it to be. And at that point, you've really got to start looking at how can you be more efficient in the way you are handling all these tasks, because these tasks are important and it's important that you get them right. But just throwing people, more and more people to handle these tasks is going to be taking away from the profitability of your firm. And uh, so I, I, I'm sure we're going to talk more about that. As we are for profit. On. Write that down. Yeah. We are for profit. <laughs> okay. So we've established, yeah. So we've established, I mean, Purchasing requires a great amount of time from every business owner at every level. Let's talk about those hours. And I think this is what many of you may be wondering. How do you account for those hours when you are creating a design fee? Is it kind of baked into that design fee? Is it a separate? Like, how do you make sure that you're getting paid for the hours that you're investing in the procurement process? It's a little easier to establish, you know, the numbers associated with the design process, but we never want to forget the purchasing process. So I'll start with you, Kate. Okay, are you sure you want to start with me? Go. Okay. This is like, this is a hot topic. You guys ready? That's why we're here. I do not charge a flat fee and neither should you, especially if you haven't been in business for 15 years because you do not know how long it takes you to design anything. Okay. Because if you haven't been in business for 15 years and you don't have design manager, which has all these amazing reports to run and for you to average your projects and for you to average your hours and for you to average your square footages of all of these amazing houses that you've designed and been profitable from, you don't know really how long it's going to take you, right? You don't know if your client's going to be an a-hole or if they're going to be amazing or if they're going to take a long time or if they're going to need a handhold, right? So you don't really know. So you're going to lose your shirt on like 80% of them, you may make it up on one or two, you may not, right? So you're in this business to make money, not to give away your discount or whatever, right? So you should charge hourly, okay? Um, if you wanna go to a flat fee later, that's great. But in the beginning, I think you should charge hourly. Um, you're probably gonna have to like revisit your bills. You're not gonna be able to charge for every single hour. But I think that hourly is the most profitable way for designers to charge. We are a luxury service. Say it again with me. We are a luxury service. Thank you. A okay. Good group. You have a talent. You have a gift that regular people, which is what we call regular people in my office, do not have. Okay. They do not have our gift. We have a gift. Okay. Don't forget that. Don't forget that when you're sending that invoice. Don't forget that when you're billing. 
regular people don't have what we have. Okay. So you should be billing by the hour, just like your doctor or your lawyer or everything. Okay. So don't let them negotiate with you. Don't let them try to talk you down. You have a gift. So I bill by the hour. I don't bill a flat fee. Neither should you. That's my two cents. <laughs> so <laughs> that's, <All right>. there you <laughs> go. Other, it may work for other people. It, it's just how I work. And that's like, I just think it's more profitable ever since we, ever since I've been in business, I've always billed hourly. A lot of people will try to negotiate you. They will try to say this other designer does it this way. It may work for other people. I'm not saying it doesn't work for other people and it's not profitable for them. I think it's pro for what I do, my business model, it's the most profitable for me. Yeah. You know, for sure it works for you. I know for sure. And that's what you me. can share. Yes. Love it. Excellent. Maria, what about you? And that's fu funny to follow up on that because I charge flat feet. Yeah. And, and she was like, oh, I knew this was going to happen. See, I told you it's a hot topic, right? Yeah. yeah. And she's I, very I profitable. Them, Look I at her. I put them in this order for a reason. Yeah. yeah no. But uh, when I started the business, I was I was hourly until probably eight years in, nine years in. We documented every single hour. I still have that historical data. The one thing I will say is that if you are truly a business person and you have a budget sheet, and you know what your overhead is and you know what your profitability is and you set you set sales goals for yourself, for your lifestyle, for your family. I kind of am in the model model now of like I'm making the money that I want and more. Therefore, why do I have to pain my employees with the headaches of charging hourly? But I have all the documentation but you behind know. it. I know. Yeah. And we will we do discuss a lot like maybe it's time to check in again. Like, especially if we start to hire new people, we might say like, okay, we're going to, we're going to track hours. We're not going to build hourly, but we're going to track hours just to do like a little checkpoint for us. Um, I would say that I am a very odd duck in this world of, we are very, very process driven in our company. And so I am a very confident person of like, I, my numbers are accurate. I review them seven to 10 days after the close of every month. So like I, there's no question of like, are we not being profitable? I call out a client. We only allow for one set of revisions um, after we show them the design. So if they want to go above that, it's in our contract that we will bill hourly for that or give them a new flat fee. If they change the scope of work at all, like wanting to add wallpaper in another bathroom, we change our scope of, in our flat fee for it. So I hear you. And I think that there are a lot of creative designers that aren't as strong in the business side of it. And I think absolutely hourly is important for them. But for us, because we have we invested so much time in our processes and how we do things. Um, and I have the team. I have a CPA who is the director of accounting for me. Um, so we just I have the right people to be able to manage it for us. It was like we have less headaches. We're not getting in fights. And I will say that I get a lot more referrals and I have a lot more clients coming back to me now that we are flat fee because they know what to expect. And they um, they can just set their budget appropriately. So like double edged sword. There's not I would say maybe just not as strongly like I don't think there's like 100 percent. Everybody should do it one way. You got to know like how you are and what works for you. But um, I've done it both ways. And there's certainly positives and negatives to both. It's about the data is what it boils down. It to. is. It you have the data is. to support it and back it up. You can run your business however you want. But you've got to have that data to know for sure. To answer your question, though, because I don't think we did. Um, when it comes to I didn't answer your when it comes to actually expediting when we were hourly we did bill for it because I, it's part of our process you know like why why is the designer's time more important than the getting their furniture to them you bill for every hour yeah so we always we always bill the only people I didn't bill for on my team was um, accounting but everybody else on our team accounting and marketing but everybody else on the team we build hourly for it's weird to build to build. Yeah, it's weird. It is a little yeah. weird. I know. That's Seems where the weird. double dipping comes yeah. in. I know. I hear you. Peter, how do you account for the hours associated with purchasing and procurement in your business? So I'm going to be the, uh, I'm going to break the, uh, uh, the tie here. Controversial. Um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm definitely uh, with Kate on this one. So um, when we get a call from a client, the way I always, uh, because it's always going to be a new, new potential client. They're always going to want to know, how do you bill? I mean, what's this going to cost? And so the way I typically will answer that is I say that we're a professional services firm, like attorneys or accountants or whatever, we charge for our time. And then we tell them exactly what the uh, hourly rate is. 
and uh, we, when we send a meeting confirmation, we send a copy of our billing policy. And so they know that from the front end. And, and so we're able to bill for all of the time that we have associated with the project. What we typically find is, and maybe different for you guys, is that initially the client may just want us to do certain things because they don't know, really know us. They don't have confidence in us yet. And so they're just going to ask us just to do this particular part of the project. But as they get confident with the lead designer and the rest of the design group, they start asking for more things. Well, can you do a rendering of that? Well, sure. You know, they know what our rate is. They've been billed a couple of times now. We bill each month. And they, they're comfortable with that. And they keep asking us to do more and more stuff as you gain more and more confidence with them. And so just like um, Kate uh, on expediting orders and specifying stuff, uh, we're, we're billing for that and we document that. Now there is time involved in that all of our designers have got to keep track of their time each day. So if they're at our office for eight hours, they're keeping track of which project they're working on and how much time they, they're putting into, into those tasks and a detail of those tasks, just like you would get from, say, your attorney if, if you're getting a bill from them or, or their accountant. So we're definitely on, on, on bill by the hour. Right. Um, I was just going to say one thing. If you are going to do the hourly billing, I highly recommend doing a project analysis at the end and just documenting that information because even if you get down the road and you start feeling the headaches of what comes with hourly billing, if you can have the information of, we d we've done projects like this in the past. It was this many square feet. Um, this this location, I, we change our fees depending on where it's located um, because more headaches come with, like we were just talking about being on an island and I have to barge furniture in. That They have higher fees than, you know, if it's a mile away from my office. So, um, but being able to at least have that information at your fingertips of, this is how much a project like yours cost. You will at least take that layer away of the pain of hourly to be able to give them a, a, a ballpark range of what, because I, I've been a client too. Um, I, we just did a big landscape project in our backyard and we added a pool and we did an addition on. And if they were to tell me like, well, it's just going to be hourly, it's, you know, $300 an hour. I'd be like, cool. What is that? Like, are and we talking? And that's not what we do. Of we, course, of right. course, we run reports, right? Yeah. We use our design manager reports. We say to our clients, if your house is this many square foot, square feet, the range will be between this and this, right? Just like you would with a furnishings budget, depending on, you know, it depends on your client though, right? Like if you're going to be a nightmare, you're probably going to take more time, right? If you're going to, we have a lot of clients that are like, I'm busy. I like what you do. I'll see you in three years. And you're like, bye. And they're great, right? So there's a lot of people that that respect your process. And then there's people that don't respect your process, right? And those people are going to take. So we give them a wide range, right? We give people a range in the very beginning and say, it could be between this much per, per you know, for, for the life of the project or this much, right? It's a big range, but they're spending a lot of money building a beautiful custom home. So they should be aware of what that's going to be, right? But I think that if you're, it depends also on the tier of design that you're doing. If you're doing really, really high-end luxury homes, a lot of my clients don't want to renegotiate a contract with me in the middle of their house. If they say, I want to add a back house and a pool house, and I want you to do it, they don't want me to come and be like, but guess what? That's not in my contract. So we need to just go ahead and renegotiate it. They're like, I just paid you a boatload of money. So just do it. Okay. And I'm busy. So for us, hourly works with our clients because sometimes they just are like, I literally own you. So do it, you know, right? So for my type of clientele, that, that a, hourly, a higher hourly rate and an hourly rate works best, right? They don't, they want to sign that contract once and then they're like, I own you. Okay. Thank and if you. they add, they're paying for it. They're paying they're for it. They're like, they girl, just do what I said. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So that works best for us, right? They don't, they don't want the headache of renegotiating, adding to a scope of work and doing it again and going back and forth and renegotiating a fee. And they want to just be able to add or buy another house next door and add it to the whatever. So that works for them. And we found that that's a better model for our type of clientele. And if they, they want to add those things or they are like, hey, guess what? My kid's going to college. I want you to do the dorm room. And you're like, what? Okay. 
really? You're going to overpay for that, but okay. So like, whatever, right? Like, yes. Okay. No problem. <laughs> so, you know, you never know. So do how it. do you guys, how do you each track your hours? So Bria, to your point, like, even if you're charging flat fee, you still need to be tracking your hours so that you have that data. So what do you guys use to track your hours, an app or any, any, uh, uh sure. So, uh, uh, we use Design Manager, all three of us, and Design Manager is sponsoring this here today. So a uh, shout out to them. Uh, their software makes it very, very easy. Each one of our designers has a, um, it's an Excel sheet, and uh, they record their time every day. So basically, which project they're working on, how long they've spent on that particular task. And then at the end of the month, um, all of those 13 individual sheets come in, we um, uh, then put them all together into one big sheet, we sort that by um, client, um, we edit it, as you were saying that sometimes, you know, a designer might have 20 hours on a rendering and you can't bill for that, so you edit that down, upload it into Design Manager and send out your invoices. It's very simple. Bria, how about you? We've got, we've used a lot of different things. I think what comes down to is what works best for each person on the team because it's not something that we're doing client facing you know when we when we do a time tracking on a project i would say it's just whatever's most comfortable we've had um team members that have used to harvest this one app um some people like excel design manager just you know whatever whatever they want to do because it's just for us it's collecting the information not necessarily like how it looks yeah, a lot of my design clients have used Harvest very successfully. It's a very robust um, app called Harvest. What do I? We use Outlook because we all have iPhones and we are on construction sites and like at our computers. And so if you are, you know, not while you're driving, excuse me, if you are <laughs> get in your car after your meeting and you adjust your time and then we have someone on our team who is amazing and she actually imports all of that into Design Manager and does the monthly billing. Um, and adjusts everything and it's all time coded and it's all like actually coded like an attorney's office, right? So everything uses a billing code and then the, the clients are aware of what each code means. So um, it's really it's really actually efficient and it's not doesn't take that long. And it's very important. Okay, let's talk a little bit about sourcing. I did want to ask each of you to give us your insight on sourcing. So obviously we're here at High Point Market. Uh, there's great value in sourcing for your business, you know, through trade resources, obviously for profitability and service. But I know a lot of people are sourcing retail as well. And there's this kind of balance or imbalance, if you will. So, Kate, I'm going to start with you. Should I not? I'm going to start with you. Um, I just like to hear your perspective on that balance of, you know, retail versus to the trade and the benefits associated with, you know, focusing on trade brands. If you're sourcing retail, just can stop it right now, okay? Just stop it right now, okay? If you're passing on your discount, stop it right now, okay? Um, just, yes. So you should just be shopping for the, from the trade, you guys. Um, all the retail buyers are here at market buying the same furniture we are. So stop buying retail. Okay, I know it's not conducive. Like when we first start out, we don't all have a warehouse. We don't all have an Amex with an unlimited, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like limit. Um, but if you can really try to buy from those trade vendors, okay? Um, if you've noticed when you buy a lot from a catalog vendor, your discount never increases, right? It's still like 10 or 15%. That margin is trash, you guys. That is no money in your pocket, okay? You're never going to make any money doing this if that's your margin. So go visit the trade vendors. Ask them what their discounts are. Ask them if they tier, right? The more you buy, the more you make. So um, find out who your rep is. Get to know them. Get to know how they can help you, how they can help better service you. Um, there's so much so many resources for the trade. I just think that, you know, there's, there's so much out there. I know it's overwhelming. We have a rule when we come to market. If we don't like at least five things in the showroom, we just keep walking. So if that helps edit for you, 
that helps me um, because you could be here for weeks. <laughs> so if that helps edit, you know, if you don't like five things and just keep walking, um, don't open an account unless you love 10 things maybe. Right. Um, but I think that you've got to know that you have to, you have to have those margins. You have to have a 20% at least, you know, I like a 30%. I mean, I love a 50%. Okay. Uh, why do you think I open brick and mortar? Okay. Wait till you hear what those margins are. So please, please understand your margins and know that if you're purchasing for your clients, 10 or 15% just doesn't cut it. So don't buy from catalog. Like I know those pieces are great, but there's other great pieces out there and you're creative, you're talented. You can make those other great pieces work. So, so do better, do better Buy the pieces that will make you the money. Okay. Yes. Bria. Yeah. I mean, I, I piggyback on that. Um, I would say the only thing in, about the question is it depends on where you're at with your business. If you're just starting out, it can be really hard to go and open up accounts with every single type of product that you need to be able to resource for your projects. Um, when I started, I worked really hard at least at where, what am I going to sell the most of? So like upholstery or it's a big category. Um, where, what is a brand that can kind of check all the boxes for no matter what type of project. So if it's a client that has a smaller budget, um, is it a good enough quality though, that I could put in a project that is a higher budget. Um, and then I focus on that brand. And honestly, my business model is still set up that way. We don't have accounts with 20 different upholstery lines. Um, because now I do it where I am one of their biggest customers. And so we get even deeper discounts from them um, so that that margin gets even greater. I mean, like I would never do 30% anymore. You know, it's like we want, we want more than that, you know, but I, that's because I've dedicated my business to certain amount of vendors and really been able to give them a lot of volume. And so then they give us a deeper discount. So um, if you're just starting out, then maybe you start with one category that is really um, profitable, which I always think furniture is a great one because you can customize it then so then they can't shop you. It like covers a lot of categories, not just the margin topic, but you can make it so that, you know, it feels like a one of a kind piece. You can put more creativity into it. Therefore, your portfolio looks better um, and it's more unique and all of that. So I would that's say good just, advice. just pick one. Narrow that pool. That's really good advice. Yeah. Peter? Um, similar kind of thing. We, um, you know, our, our brand is high-end residential. That's, that's the kind of work that we do. We only uh, buy direct from the manufacturer after all these years to Abria's point when we first got started, it was hard to open accounts. And now that's flipped where folks are interested in us because we're buying in large volume. So we only buy direct from the manufacturer. Um, we're very transparent with our clients in terms of, uh, uh, of how we bill. As I mentioned, we charge a, a flat fee for our design time. Our merchandise, we sell at cost plus 30%. And that might be because of the market that we serve here in the Carolinas is maybe not the same as it might be in New York or California and stuff. So we're very clear to the client, if they want to buy it through us, uh, they're going to be able to buy it with our manufacturer's discount plus 30%. Um, and, um, and so that's sort of how we do it. The only, the only thing I might say about retail uh, is that um, we found over the years that if a client is wanting to buy something very inexpensively, then we'll encourage them to buy retail. So we'll say, like if somebody is doing, a, a, say, a study and they just need a, um, they're going to have some very expensive pieces, but they might just need a, a lamp in the corner and they don't want to spend a lot of money on that, then we, we'll maybe just tell them, look, just buy it yourself and buy it from retail because for us to sell a $200 lamp by the time we've placed the order and, um, and got it in and dealt with maybe some warranty issues and stuff to make 60 bucks, it's not worth it. And so we will just tell, tell them, you know, you, you just go ahead and buy that. And, I rec and so we'll, we'll, we'll steer them towards retail. We're, we're the same. If, if a client does come and is like, I love the Serena and Lily piece. I have to have it in my home. Great. Like it's their house. I can't dictate like, sorry, you're working with me. You can't have it. Um, but we do tell them they need to buy it on their own. So we don't order it. We don't manage it. We don't install it. 
And it's just, and we tell them because, you know, you're not paying us for that. And so like, and like we, you want that also probably because of the price point, you don't want us to put a markup on it. So we just have them ordered on them their own. Can I be the devil's advocate here? Well, that's one of my, you guys skipped ahead, but that was one of my questions is, you know, what is that conversation like? Because I know you guys are all wondering and you have to have this conversation with your clients about, you know, you know, everybody's experiencing clients shopping around you. It happens. So you've got to have that conversation up front. You need to kind of set those boundaries. What does that look like? What if you you have that conversation up front? So if you have, if you come to me, you have the conversation up front where um, if you work with us, you don't get to buy anything at all. And if you have an heirloom piece or you have pieces that are really important to you and they want to, you want them to be worked into this, to the design, I love that. I love that. Even if it is from Serena and Lily or if it's from somewhere that you already have it and it's important to you, great. Let's see it. Let's measure it. We'll work it in, right? Or we'll tell you like absolutely not. But but most of the time we'll work in if it's important to you. If you're just being cheap and you want to use it, no. But if you want to work it in because it's important to you, then yes, okay? But if you want to shop something and you want to like collaborate? No. Okay. So we have this conversation up front. This is not a collaboration because if you had good taste, you would not need me. Okay. So I am here to design your house. And how do you, you say it? You can say it jokingly. You can say it in a nice way, right? We say it up front and we say that we are here. We purchase everything for the home and we purchase all of it is our design. It is, we purchase everything that we design and we design the entire home for you so that you don't have to because your time is better spent doing something else that you're an expert Making the money to pay you. (laughs) Right? Being a mother, being a executive, being whatever it is that you're doing, right? That's why you have me. Thank goodness. Okay? Thank goodness. So don't you dare try to bring me and make me use some crate and barrel crap lamp. Okay? I'm just kidding. I love crate and barrel sometimes. But, But I'm just saying... So I will, however, if you want to use a crate and barrel lamp or something, I will be like, fine, we'll use it. But or or I'll say, hey, I found one from a lower cost trade vendor because there is lower cost trade vendors, too. You guys, there there's all kinds. There's all kinds of levels of trade vendors that crate and barrel probably bought that lamp from. Okay, so I'm just saying that you don't they don't need to be filling in. And also that house has my name on it. Okay. So I don't need you filling in the gaps. Okay. Because that house has my name on it. So I want it to feel like you and be wonderful and gorgeous. And I want you to feel like it's your home and I want it to be a direct representation of you, but it really does has, it has our name on it. So I want to make sure that it is done completely and perfectly. And I don't want you filling in any gaps. So I'm very particular about these things. That's why I only take a few projects. So um, I'm particular and no filling in gaps with things you found on your own. But you have the important thing to note is that you have the conversation up front. front. You don't wait until the client begins to shop you. You have the conversation up front in advance along with everything else. This is all in our contract. Our contract is like 40 pages. Yeah. And you walk them through the whole thing, I would assume. Maybe not every single page, but the highlights of it and the things that are of concern and that will be a problem down the line. You have to have these conversations. Guys, we touched a little bit on the project management platform, but I want to expand upon it a little bit um, because I think you had mentioned that, you know, some businesses, you know, when you start out, you work on an Excel spreadsheet and you're playing with QuickBooks. But at some point, you need to transition to something a little more robust. How did that impact your business when you switched to a, a, a real project management platform like Design Manager, what was the impact on your business? We'll go ahead and start with you. Um, sure. Uh, it's, uh, it's a fundamental decision that everybody's going to have to make when you're, when you're growing your business because to my point uh, earlier, um, you know, you've got people in your business that are making you money. Your designers are designing and if you've got salespeople, you're billing for their time and you're making money. All of the people on the operational side are really expense, okay? They do important, important work, but they're expense. And they're taking away from your profit. So you're going to get to a point in your company's evolution where you're going to have to make that transition to a software program because 
that will limit the amount of expense that you have and make you more profit and make you more efficient, all of those important tasks. So, I mean, in our company, we might be a little bit extreme in that we've got 13 designers and we only have two people in operations. Um, and they're handling all of the purchase orders, they're handling all of the expert, expediting, all of the finances, all of the invoices. But we're pretty big believers in design managers software because it enables us to control our whole business with very little expense. And so we're pretty, we're very lean, if you will. Uh, but that makes us very efficient and it makes us very profitable. So I don't know if that answered your question. It does. And those two people in your organization are gold. They're worth their weight in gold. Yeah. And I'm one of them. So. <laughs> Give yourself a raise today. <laughs> Bria, do you want to add to that? Yeah. Um, so we are, as far as operations go, I would say um, we have a little bit more, but our teams share both of the companies. So it's it's hard to divide because we have the the retail brand too, which is all operations. So, um, but we changed to design manager. I changed to design manager when I was nine months old of a business because I um, just had the hardest time using QuickBooks to, I don't know if we're allowed to say brands by the way, but I too late now. Um, <laughs> I could not build out a custom sofa in that I still don't know how to do it. Like, I don't know how to do customization in a software that's not built for interior designers. So that was like an easy switch for me that paid itself for itself immediately when we switched to design manager. So I've been on design managers for 10 months, 10 years and three months and um, never looked back. Who's counting? Yeah, right. <laughs> um, and it and has grown and it's changed and they're so responsive to us about like having new, we have lots of ideas of what we can do and what, you know, there's so much you could do with software. Of course, it's hard work and very expensive for them to do, but they're so receptive to that information too. So um, having a software platform that has the ordering that like the designers use it, the accounting team uses it. And that, like it, it's all in one place. It's just so important for business. I kind of don't know how you do this business without it. Even if you're a one person show, like you have to have that software to back you up. I cheated because uh, the designer that I worked for before I went out on my own used design manager. So even when I went out on my own and I was working for my guest room and I only had the money in my pocket to start my company, I invested that money to buy Design Manager because that was the most important thing that I knew I was going to need. Um, I didn't even try to do QuickBooks because I knew that was going to be a hot mess. So um, plus I knew I was going to be like a giant successful business, right? So I was like, I already know that I'm going to be so great that I'm going to need this software. So even though it was in my guest room with bad carpet, I was like, I'm going to do this. Um, so that is the most like the thing you have to invest in, right? Because you cannot know that you're going to be this giant successful business with QuickBooks as a designer. It's too hard. Um, so you got to invest in those processes and systems that you know are going to grow with you because switching a software in the middle of your giant success is a nightmare. So invest in the right software right away. And those reports, like if you are not running your reports that you can see your profitability after every project. If you are not running those reports, you got to know your reports. You got to know your financials. You got to know everything. Like I was watching The Profit the other day and the guy who owns the cupcake shop didn't know how much it costs to make a cupcake. You guys, you got to know your overhead. You got to know how much it costs to run your business. You got to know how much profitability, like how much your last project was profitable, right? So know those things. Design Manager will help you know those things so easily. So you got to get it. Okay, so we could have this conversation for another hour for yeah. sure, but I know that there's questions and we have about 10 minutes for questions. And I know I have a question right up here in the front. Are you good? Okay. <laughs> Do we have like a mic that we can pass around for questions? If not, I can be the runner. I have no problem with it. Oh, Danny, God bless you. Is this working? It's working. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, who has a question? Okay, find a raised hand. and. Thank you all for your words, Jen. Wonderful information. It's great. Uh, do you charge a lower rate for the operational side than from the design? We did. What is it? 
Yeah. Well. <laughs> I mean, we're all here to learn, right? Yeah. Right. We're not. I mean, we're not hourly, yeah. so we don't have like. But when we were hourly, we certainly it was more than half less. Yeah, we tier like a law firm. So like my rate is completely different than my junior, junior, junior. Yeah, we tier. Yeah. And our clients, it's all transparent. And I would say like, as far as like what the numbers are, I think it depends on where you're located. Yeah, absolutely. Like, you you know. should call your competition. That's what I did. I was like, hi, I'm building a home and I'd like to know your rates. <laughs> Why? That's called market research, baby. Do your market research. Find out what your market, what your competition is charging. And then you just do your market research. You could just ask them too. say, hey, like we're all in this They're not going to tell you. I I, oh come on! I'm they are Minnesota. not going to tell it's you. Minnesota you nice. are so nice. We do uh, in Minnesota. Okay, yes, well I'm in Southern go. California, and they are not going to tell you in LA. <laughs> they're not going to tell you. They're going to hang up on you. Okay, <laughs> you're so nice in Minnesota. I love that. <laughs> I love that for you. It's <laughs> true. They're so nice there, like LA. They're like click. <laughs> so, note to self: Don't call Kate. <laughs> don't I will call tell you. You can call you me. You can call me. I will tell you. But my competition would not tell me. <laughs> Yeah. Um, we house a lot of inventory and we're having an issue with like our design software and what we should use for inventory. We're not at the point of having like multiple retail stores, but we don't want to like leave that off the table as we grow either. And it's an absolute disaster. So I was curious what you guys are using for that. Well, we're e-commerce based, so we use Shopify. Me too. And that is, I've had no problem managing inventory through Shopify. Um, we actually switched to NetSuite for the the e-commerce business um, just because it's it's a totally different brain than interior design work. Um, but Shopify seems to be, and it's you can keep it somewhat low cost, but it has a really great inventory and then it also does the sales part of it. So I don't, maybe you guys can tell us if design yeah, manager, yeah. whatever. Are you absolutely be, does. Do more I can, about inventory? Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because I think one of the, things that we try to avoid is having a lot of different programs that we're running. And so we only run Design Manager. And one of the menu tabs is inventory. So you can enter all of those items. And then it makes it really easy to pull um, that inventory from the inventory menu straight into project specs. And so you can encourage your designers to sell the stuff that you, that you have. Now that you say that, like I, this is why I was like, Katie should be the one on the panel, not yeah. me, because she's... Yeah, right. She's the one that actually runs the business, not me anymore. Um, but we do. Yeah. Do I talk about it a little bit? So sometimes if like the example of having to start an account with a vendor and you're like the client, we can make it with four pieces, but we want one more piece in our inventory. We can put that into design manager inventory. And then when we're ready to sell it, like you've mentioned, you can just pull it from project specs, add it to the proposal. And it we're constantly doing inventory of making sure it's all updated and it make, it's nice and easy. So. Well, there you go. Yeah. I forgot about that. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> Any other questions? Any other hands? There's one in the back, and then we'll come back up to the front. Danny's getting the steps in today. <laughs> Hi. Uh, I'm curious to know if anyone here use houses, house, sorry, software from Ivy. Is anyone here? Okay. Right? I yeah. It's yeah, terrible. that's that's that's, the, that's what you You're know. You're at the wrong panel. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm glad because it's terrible. It's okay. terrible. Good, good. good. Okay. No reports. There's no reports, so you don't know if you're profitable. It's just pretty pictures. It's not for business. This is kind of a two-part question for Kate. Um, how detailed are you? Um, for your hourly as far as like how your time was spent and then the other part is I know you said it's color um, coded so is it color coded for like your junior designer and then for you and is that on the, the invoice separately yeah so we're super um, detailed because we bill in 15 minute increments so for people who are thinking that um, who are like oh if you bill hourly like oh, my clients are so annoying and I, um, your clients stop being annoying when you build them in 15 minute increments. I don't get, um, any calls on the weekends or anything, um, because people are like, oh my God, you're going to bill me when a uh, text message is 15 minutes. Um, so, uh, people are very cognizant of your time and energy and your gift, your gift, um, when you bill in 15 minute increments. So, um, we, it's, it's actually not the color coding is for our track order tracking, but the, 
everything is coded by name. Like so they know who was doing what. So people, the clients love it. If like someone's picking up paint samples, they don't want to pay me to do that. They want a junior, junior, they want the cheapest person to pick up their paint samples, right? Or drop something off. So they appreciate that. So people don't mind if, as long as, you know, if they see what each person is doing and they know that you're, you're utilizing their investment and you're using value judgment with the time and energy. And I think they appreciate that. I'm exactly the same. We bill in 15 minutes. And when the designers are entering what they're working on, they just type that in the description field. So there's an activity code. Description is they're doing CAD drawings for the living room or whatever it is, just like you would get from your turn. And you can group it. I mean, you, yeah. you know, you, like use your best judgment. So my accountant says I only use QuickBooks. Don't ever integrate any of these other platforms to it. And so you don't use QuickBooks at all. Does that... Okay, so all accounting is done through that. Okay. When you're, now a totally different question. So when you're sourcing something, client, maybe you present them with two options for a table. Um, when, at what point does, do both options go in design manager and they're living in there until the client says yes, or do you only put the winner in, what, what, what the final selection in? We'd put both in. So, and then they're approving which one they yeah. like. So what you're okay. doing is in the project specification, you would put sofa A and sofa B, and then you send the proposal to the client. And if they select sofa A, then that's what you cut your push sword for. And as you are designing in the very beginning, and you're determining these are the two or three options I want to give, immediately in that, th that design process, it immediately goes in. And if you change your mind before you present, oh, I take it out. But... It's yeah. all in real time. Yeah, we we wouldn't we wouldn't put it in from the first meeting because in the first meeting you're still trying to get a, a feel for what okay. the client's style is and what yeah. their preferences are. So in the first meeting it's really some general proposals to understand their vision okay. and stuff. But as you tighten it up, when it gets time to start them starting to spend some money, then you'd put it in to the spec. And as you're tightening it up where because it might get confusing where does that live like oh i source these two tables and all these other things like does it for the designer does it live somewhere like in their own notes or something that they remember uh, no uh, so what you have is you've got sofa a uh, in the project specs and then the section below all the vendor information so the vendor will tell you that you're buying it from universal furniture plug in for universal and <laughs> it's and it's SKU number this, and it's part number that, and it's this color, and so forth. And so that's in the vendor information that you're keeping, for, the designer's keeping for themselves. The client is seeing just a general detail of what that sofa is and a photo of what that sofa is. Okay. That's why a design manager is so great, because there's a client screen and a... In oh, I'm and a that's not the question she Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, like when it's just out there in concept land. We don't price at, at that phase, though. Yeah. You know, like a, we we do what we call a vision phase, yeah. which is probably similar to what you guys are doing, where we're talking like more conceptual. Like a white sofa. Yeah. Like, it's just a, we like this color palette. Okay. We like the lines on these types of pieces, but it's not, this is your sofa. I haven't picked the fabric yet. Okay. When we show them the sofa that we want them, we know the fabric to finish everything. And that's when we move to putting it into design. We actually picture. don't enter anything into like pricing until it's formally like formally approved like we don't price anything until the all the because we do budgeting first so we know whatever we show them is if they approve it they can afford it so we don't actually put anything into de like design manager until it's the concept is all approved so i don't put options into design manager i put it's a con it's a design board, a concept yeah it's a concept board design uh, um i no i'm i'm old so we do like physical concept boards yeah sorry <laughs> touch. We, we're the same we're yeah. the same way yeah. you're starting off with sort of mood boards yeah. and gen yeah. very general stuff initially and you're only putting it into design manager when you get and pretty, done. pretty yeah. Yeah. it's pretty a lot of work done. putting yeah. all that in design manager so i'm not putting yeah. options in there yeah. honey like it's yeah. done 
you're buying it when I'm putting it in there. <laughs> in there. <laughs> All right. So we're right at we're right at time. So um, will you guys stick around after for, for a couple more questions? Danny, did you have anything to say before we wrap up? Well, I was supposed to be lowered from the ceiling. So my present, you know, oh, that didn't work so, out. Oh. But I just wanted to say thank you to all of our panelists and our fabulous moderator. Thank you to Universal for hosting us. We really appreciate it. Whether you're a solopreneur or you're a team of 20, your needs are the same. And it is important that you are keeping track of your business and the details. Design Manager helps everybody on this panel do so. And I'm sure that we can help you as well. So please feel free to reach out. You can get us at designmanager.com. There's a QR code on the flyers that we sent you that'll get us to us as well. And thank you all for coming. How about those sweet thank treats? Thank you. Yay. Enjoy Hi. that candy. Thank you, Design Manager and Universal. Yeah. If anybody has any other questions, you, you can Rick. come up. Mike's yeah, off. Yeah, you can come up.